So I don't think that it is in any way disempowering to acknowledge the female body uh, as being unique and from the male body. I, I just don't. Hello, good morning, and welcome to the Ninja Babes podcast. I'm here today with Dr. Linda Blade, and she's joining the call with us today from Alberta, Canada. So I'm really excited to have her on. She has a PhD in kinesiology. She is a sports coach for track and field, really a sports performance coach. Um, and her work has been, she's been explaining it to me, it's very fascinating. Uh, she works with athletes from a variety of different sports to help them improve their sports performance in their particular sport, but using her knowledge and her expertise from track and field. So she'll explain that a little bit more, but she herself is a Canadian champion back from the 1980s, um, and she just brings so much experience and um, her own perspective and skill into what she does now, and so I'm excited to have her on. Before we dive into this episode, I wanted to tell you about an important partner of Ninja Babes. Propello Life is an all-natural wellness and nutrition company that Ninja Babes has worked with for well over a year. I love working with this company because they're family owned. All of their products are all natural, non-GMO, and not only do they taste great, but I feel great taking them. If you've ever taken pre-workout before and you feel like you've gotten hit by a truck or your heart is going to explode, <laughs> their products are not like that. Their products are all natural. They'll give you a that natural like boost of energy if you're taking the energy and focus blend. If you take the pre-workout, you will feel that hype, but it's not the same as some of those other chemical-based companies that will leave you with dry mouth, cause you to overly sweat, and all these other weird side effects. So if you're looking for a company that has great all-natural products, they even have vegan and whey proteins, definitely check out Propello Life. Best of all, if you go over to propellolife.com and use code NINJABABES, all caps, you'll get 10% off your order and free shipping, and you'll be supporting the Ninja Babes podcast. So if you're looking for a way to get amazing products that taste great and that supplement your nutrition and a way to support the Ninja Babes, head on over to propellolife.com and use code NINJABABES on your order, and you won't be sorry. Thanks for your support, and thank you for trying out Propello Life. Uh, we're going to be talking more today about our broad topic of gender differences in ninja and in sport. And we're just excited. I'm excited to hear more about your story, Linda, and just what you have to share with us. So welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much. Should I call you Ninja Babes or should I call you Kara <laughs> or what? You can call me Kara or okay. I, I know my audio name in the, in, in yeah. the recording platform says Ninja Babes. But That's you, right. So... So Ninja Babes Nation, hi, and Kara, hi. Um, yes, I um, have had a fairly uh, rich life in sports, I would say. Um, I grew up in South America, actually, played soccer in the streets uh, and just, you know, then found my love with track and field. Uh, then I moved to Canada. Then I got an NCAA scholarship in heptathlon. Uh, I was an All-American for the University of Maryland. And um, then I came back to Canada to try to train for the Olympic team in the heptathlon. And, and I was national champion. And I got to do a lot of international competitions, but I was injured for the Olympics. So that's sad. But anyway, um, then I um, moved on and decided to get my PhD in kinesiology, sports sciences, I was, uh, my area of interest is actually looking at the human morphology. So differences between males and female bodies through the growth and development process. Uh, I was measuring children in Canada in terms of like just anthropometry, their body dimensions. Then I actually collected some data in Africa. I went over to Africa with my husband. I had gotten married to a farm boy who is a PhD in, uh, in agriculture. So then I found myself on the African continent. So I was comparing bodies and basic functions of kids uh, performing in different contexts and different lifestyles. So I had a lot of insight into that. And when I came back to Canada, um, I, instead of becoming a professor, I decided to become a sport performance professional, which is combining my track and field background and all the basics of training for speed, power, and endurance and all of that uh, with with uh, sports, people from different sports. So after about 30 years of this, 25 years of it, I guess, for sure, 
Um, I have coached athletes in about 17 different sports. Uh, and the way that works is, um, um, because track and field and things like gymnastics are the foundational sports in the Olympic movement, um, other sports come along by adding tactics to your basic running speed, jumping power. And so really I have sort of in track the alphabet of human movement. And what we do is I take an athlete, let's say a hockey player who wants to be faster on the ice. Um, I will, I can take that person off the ice and help them get faster on land and then they can apply it to the ice. So it's very specialized kind of training. That's so cool to hear. I love that. I, I feel like we could just dive right into that and talk all about sports performance training the rest of the podcast. But that's, well, I guess that <laughs> kind of does lean into what we're going to talk about. But yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah so I would say that um, I have a lot of insights into human movement in general, uh, how the body performs, uh, what are the factors that impact on that. Um, and obviously a really strong interest in keeping uh, men's male sports and female sports sort of distinct because I, I really believe that males have an advantage. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of your listeners have seen what is called the biomotor abilities chart, but there's this, this sort of general sort of pyramid where if you imagine a pyramid where you have three corners, strength at the top, speed on the bottom right-hand corner, and endurance on the bottom left-hand corner. So you have your like basic strength, speed, endurance. That's the basic starting point. Um, then I'll go from there. So let's go to the top of the pyramid. Strength is, um, there's probably men have like 30 to 60% advantage in weightlifting, for example, in maximum strength. And um, and then in grip strength, um, which would probably, you know, apply very strongly to, to the whole ninja movement. <laughs> And, um, that's about a 10% advantage. So grip strength, women can get up pretty close to male levels. And then in terms of speed, um, on the right bottom, right hand corner of the pyramid, 10 to 15%, uh, endurance 20 to 40%. Now think about this. If you're imagining your head, this pyramid strength, speed, endurance, now you can start combining things. So the if you want to think about power, so like think about a gymnast, gymnast jumping and doing flips and power and like whipping around, that's a combination of strength and speed. So the power is sort of along that one line, that one edge of the pyramid between strength and speed is the power area, right? And about, that's incredibly variable. Like... Um, there's something about how the human body is made, and I can get into that later, but the human body is really a unique kind of structure compared to other mammals. Other mammals, you walk on all fours, like let's say cats, dogs, you know, whatever, but we're upright beings. So we're like moving skyscrapers in a way, like we're just on two feet and we have this upright linear body. And so the way we produce power is by adding forces through segments from, from bottom to top or top to bottom. So if you're whipping, let's say you see a, a gymnast sort of hanging from the rings and they arch their back and then whip themselves up to do a dismount, um, then that's all the different segments of the body combining in some sort of an elastic way. And that's adds to power. So you can add up all the segment strengths. And in some cases, power, let's say if you're just doing like a power clean or a, a power, like a explosive Olympic lift, you know, that might be a 50% difference. Men can generate a higher percentage than females to 50%. But if it's like a punch where you're adding speed to that, males can actually be 160% higher than females. And that, that came out in the world rugby, um, <clears throat> in the world rugby um, consultations. Um, and um, so basically, um it's like if if men are gaining velocity with their strength, they can produce a huge amount of explosive power that exceeds women like by 160%. That's amazing, right? So that's a, a injury waiting to happen if it's in a contact sport. Mm -hmm. So then that's that side of the pyramid. That's in and sport is a lot about that, isn't it? It's it's a lot about adding taking your strength and your speed 
and combining them into s- explosive movements, right? And and that's the area where males tend to have the biggest advantage. That's why I addressed it first. Um, the other corner of the pyramid is is the aerobics, like the the endurance corner, which is like the left hand bottom part of the pyramid. Between the speed and and the endurance on the base of the pyramid, that's like you know maybe twenty males have twenty to forty percent in a uh, improvement better or, or advantage over women. Um, and that would be like races that include like 400 meter or 800 meter sprint in um, track and field where it is a sprint, <clears throat> but it involves longer, longer um, um, distances. And then you have on the final edge of the pyramid, you have between strength and, and endurance, you have the strength endurance, mus- strength endurance area along the sort of left-hand side of the pyramid. And that's kind of like maybe, for example, um, well, you'd use that a lot in, in the ninja area because you, you're trying, you're breathing hard, you're, you're hanging on and, and you're just, you're exerting a lot of force and strength, but you have to do it for, uh, you know, through the whole course. So that's, um, very important component where it's, you need strength, but also the endurance to keep going with that strength. Um, and that, I would say in that area, males have about 20 to 40%, uh, as adults, 20 to 40% uh, advantage. Yeah. So I'm, I Googled a picture of this pyramid as you're speaking, because I'm a very visual person. Um, and I'll definitely, we can find a good one that we can link actually in the podcast. But so I'm wondering these percent values, how did people and researchers and scientists come up with these percentages? Like, what is that based off of? Yeah, um, there are lots of research done on each of those components. So, like, for example, um, you can go into the world weightlifting records for each weight class. You know, so men who are a certain weight and women in that same weight category, they both lift, you know, their weight, and you can see the difference. So, so what you do is you just take – you take performances that represent each of those characteristics and you just look at the men and women's performances and you can chart the difference in track and field. It's very simple. Of course. I mean, you can look at, you know, the speed of the hundred meters, how, what do women run it in? What do the men, what does Usain Bolt do? Uh, what does the, the, the female champion do? And then you just compare them. Um, so a lot of it just comes from straight up physical evidence. Sure. Do you do you think that? So I'm sure you'll explain. But that physical evidence is a lot of it linked to how much testosterone is in a person's body, like the the actual biomarkers that will kind of justify and and cause those limits to happen in one individual individual over another. Is that just um, yeah? Way? Like you can link it. I mean, when. Um, uh, when the testosterone is reduced, um, the the certain characteristics diminish to some degree. Um, uh, running may, for example, running speed may diminish, you know, a couple percentage points, but it, it doesn't take care of it all. And we have to remember that the male testosterone has been in play from before birth. So, when in gestation, a baby is is growing in the womb, and it happens to be a male. And then it goes down this other track where there's there's more, um, um, and, well, testosterone and other kinds of hormones that are are making the the baby turn into a male. Um, there's a reason that, for example, if if the if testosterone didn't have an effect in the womb, babies wouldn't be born with you know two different sets of genitalia, penis, and vagina. I mean, obviously, in those first nine months already. Um, there's been a huge difference in the tracking of how that body looks. So when you get to, by the time a person's an adult, you take the best males and the best females. And that's what sports is about, is about not the best female versus the average male, the best female versus the best male. And inevitably there's these lots of structural differences as, I mean, you probably have seen males have, Generally, they're taller. Generally, they have longer limbs. Generally, they have broader shoulders. Um, they have, you know, lats that are probably a lot bigger than, you know, for like pulling up and stuff like that. And they have um, higher muscle mass. Well, basically, for generation of speed and power, a lot has to do with your levers. Like I would say, your swinging pendulums, which are your limbs, 
So if there's a bigger reach or a bigger swinging pattern, obviously you're going to cover more ground or be able to reach further, right? I mean, there's there's just so many differences in morphology. And like, for example, a female will have wider hips in general compared to um, a male in the same sort of sport um, and higher amount of muscle mass. So then you're going to get into this whole thing of strength to weight ratio um, for their, for any given amount of, of strength or weight that males tend to have more strength for that same amount of weight. Um, so like if you're dangling there in the sky and you're trying to hold up your body weight, you know, it helps if it's not too much body fat there, mm-hmm. as you would know. Um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is, the morphological differences between males and females greatly informs their performance differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially then if males and females are competing against one another, it in general, it seems that the males are always going to outperform to a certain extent. For the most part. And you're going to get the odd female who can beat a male in a certain way. Um, And I would say, um, in the middle of that pyramid, if you're looking at it, there's things like coordination and flexibility. And I would say that women tend to have greater flexibility as is probably <laughs> in general, you can probably stay, see that all over the place. If you're involved in any kind of sport, um, women tend to be a lot more bendy <laughs> and, and coordination wise, Coordination is a, is a funny term because it's it's how you learn to to move, you know, in a certain pattern or or learn a skill. But it's also maybe reaction time is part of that. Maybe the link between coordination and speed is probably reaction time and and agility. Men actually do react a little faster. Like even when you look at the starting blocks in the in the race races, men can. React is partly to do also with strength. Uh, reaction time, you know, your ability to react to something with force obviously does require a little bit of strength as well. So even the word reaction time is a loaded word. Um, but, you know, I would say on the skill side of it, women can be extremely skillful. I mean, mm-hmm. there if you're in a complex um, uh, course where you have to learn and there's just some trick to doing a certain move, women actually could probably learn it, you know, really well and, and really be right up there with the guys in terms of their execution and the skill and how it looks. Um, so like just how the brain works with the muscles to get those muscles to move efficiently and in the right way to execute the skill. That's, that's possible to, to have a very, you know, beautiful comparison, like equivalent between men and women, uh, and they'll find their own strategies. You'll see athletes find their own strategies to a, a, a complex task. And I'm sure you've seen that over and over again. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's, that's all part of the coordination. Definitely. And I think that's kind of the point that I wanted to harp on for a second is, you know, I think in Ninja Warrior, our biggest question is, you know, we've, our, our sport is greatly, um, focused on strategy. Like there's so much skill involved, but there's also so much strategy. Like, do you know your own body? Do you know your own limits? Do you understand the, your own body mechanics well enough to know, you know, just looking at an obstacle that you've never touched before, just looking at it and trying to assess it. Do I know how to make my body work the best and perform the best on this specific style of obstacle? Um, and so that's something that when we when in our sport, when we've been talking about women in sports and, and, um, what is our female strength within Ninja? I've wondered a lot, like, are we better at planning and thinking through those um, strategies and those thoughts for the obstacles before we get on them or during the obstacle? Are we better than we think we are? Or have we maybe seen um, some of our elite women do really well because they, they are really good at strategizing and just their own body awareness and their own ability to predict how they'll do on that obstacle. So yeah, I like to speak to that. There was a uh, research done on astronauts. Um, obviously, NASA NASA was as very interested in how males and females react to sort of a novel test or sort of a new challenge that they encounter. And it appears from the, their research that when faced with a difficult task, and then you can imagine if you're floating around in space and there's an emergency, 
um, and, a, and some difficult problem solving uh, confronts you, um, it, the strategies are slightly different. Um, males tend to react quicker, but at greater risk, whereas women will tend to pause and actually work it out first. They won't react quite as fast. <clears throat> but they'll, you know, but then they'll be probably more accurate and less likely to make a mistake. So that is interesting, isn't it? Like, I, I think women do have a very strong sense, even, especially in sports is like, instead of sort of, you know, taking the risk and sort of saying, well, I'll try this one and see what happens. They probably want to play it out a little more in their mind about what's going to be the outcome if I actually expose myself to that move. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, I mean, I would say that the coolest thing in the Ninja Warrior uh, system of, 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 or I could say sport, is basically to see those individual strategies and, and just marvel at just the ingenuity and the, and the innovation that people have. And I don't think that that would be any different between uh, women and men. I think I think they come at it from a different perspective. And, and I think women, every athlete, not just women, but every athlete knows their own limitations. So, and they know their strengths. So they're going to probably try and, and go for a strategy that matches what they feel their strength is, or their advantage for their particular body and bodies. Every human body is, is different, even within the categories, you know, one female's body is going to be completely different than the other. And, and so, um, yeah, I think that's the beauty of it. And that's why it's so magical to watch each individual athlete to see what they're going to come up with, whether male or female. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So over the past couple of months, as we've been having this conversation within the Ninja Babes and the greater Ninja Warrior um, sport about gender differences, something that keeps coming up is how you know, women, we get so, and young girls, like we get so excited when we see our top women athletes like Jesse Graff, Jess LeBrecht, Alyssa Beard, all these different women doing so incredibly well. Michelle Warnke, uh, Sandy Zimmerman, like ones that have just really broken past what we felt like was our own limitation. And I know that that's something that so many women and girls hold on to as like, well, if they can do it, like, why can't I? Um, and just really setting them as the mark that we should be aiming for. Um, but I guess the, the broader question is, we know that there are physiological differences between men and women. So how can we push our females to compete, you know, the hardest they can, like find their, their, you know, top level of performance, but not make them feel like this negative sense of, well, you need to stay in your own league though, or your own division because you're just never going to be as good as the guys. So like, you still have to be separate. Like, how do we get away from that negative perception of, oh, it's women's sports are lesser than? Yeah. Um, well, I think that um, this happens in track and field. Uh, it's a great parallel. Um, everybody goes through the same course. Like both women and men run the 100 meters. You get their time. And it's not as if, you know, as if somehow they're on a completely different track. They're on the same track. They're doing the same thing. And they're both celebrated. Um, and then they both can stand on the podium in their own categories um, I, I just don't see, I don't know. I don't see how that's disempowering to women to have their own category because you can do the exact same, you can be involved in the exact same day. The I mean, you could even, even alternate a man does the course, a woman does the course or whatever, but, but once you've got their time, their performances, it still should be compared with the same body, the same category of bodies, you know, and, and, um, I'm going to offer, I guess, um, an analogy in, in community sports or development sports, um, that I'm also the president of track and field association for this province of Alberta, which is the kind of the state in Canada. So kind of the same as a state. And, um, <clears throat> so we have, you know, obviously we have the different age categories of kids and, um, and so we compete by age and then by sex, right? So, um, so let's say like the U 12 under 12 boys and girls, and then they, they have competitions and then we award them separately. But so I guess what I'm saying is it wouldn't be, um, I don't think if you have an 18 year old, you 18 and all of a sudden you, you throw them in with a U 12 and the 12 year olds, 
Um, I don't think if, if, if it was, you know, and that would be obviously totally unfair to put an 18 year old in with a 12 year old, but, but if an 18 year old would go in that race and they'd win, and then you'd just say, well, we're going to give a separate award to the 18 year old. Cause that's not the same, you know, they're not in the same category, but all the other 12 year olds who ran in that race get, you know, gold, silver, bronze. I don't think those boys would feel disempowered. They just know that the 18 year old was not supposed to necessarily be there or it was a different category and they still were competing amongst each other. Um, so the idea of empowerment, uh, like the idea of, let's put it the other way, the idea of combining all categories and getting rid of stratification of, of categories as a way of empowering people. I think it's a, it's not a legitimate way to look at it because in sport, it's the stratification of it that makes, gives people more opportunity. So you have the U12, then you have the U14 age group, then you have the U16. By actually having layers and and stratification of categories where you can actually narrow the band between who's competing with who, that's more empowering because it gives more people opportunities to succeed. Um, nobody looks at that and says, oh gosh, I don't feel like I'm worthy because I'm in the U12 and some U18 person got a medal in the other category. I don't think people look at it that way. And so I would feel like, I don't think you're sending a wrong message. You're just saying you're acknowledging the truth. Males are different than females. We have males, uh, the male awards system and the females awards they are all competing on the same track. They all have to figure out and we can all celebrate their tactical genius and their strategies. But at the end of the day, two different body types. It's like I was saying the other day, Kara, about in some ways, you, you see this in the world of automobile racing. You have NASCAR races. You have Formula One races. Those bodies of those vehicles are completely different. And, you know, people would say, well... You know, so if somebody would say this, what they do for women and men now, oh, they all have like four tires and they have a, like, they should all just be in the same group. Well, if you'd throw a, a Formula One car into a NASCAR race, everybody say, well, what the heck? What does that even mean? Some Formula One car comes in and beats all the NASCAR vehicles. I mean, you don't even, you're not even comparing the same thing with the same thing. How is that even empowering? It's not. It's just saying, oh, this is crazy. It doesn't have any meaning if we're just going to include a different body type in in, a, in this in this competition. Um, so I don't think that it is in any way disempowering to acknowledge the female body uh, as being unique and, from the male body. I, I just don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I completely hear what you're saying. Um, I think part of just kind of thinking introspectively and like looking back in the past couple years of like league competitions and on the show, I think what it's been is almost like this sense of pride, but in like a weird way of, oh, well, we should, you know, we want to be recognized. We want to be counted. We want to feel valued the way that the the guys get recognition or value and whatnot. Um, and I think that perhaps it's been this push of like, well, you know, maybe we should compete on, like continue to always compete on the same course and like push to even just be on the overall podium so that we feel more valued or we feel like we're recognized um but i hear what you're saying is that you know in in always pushing for that co-ed experience then yeah there will be women who aren't at that top 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 elite tier who just completely feel like ignored or left out or just not recognized for their own accomplishment in their ability level yeah. And I would say that that's um, something that would be very complex and something that you would have to deal with um, in terms of how it's almost more about the sociology of handing out awards, right? Like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's not necessarily even about the course itself. Although I might say, um, if you took the anthropometric uh, measurements or sort of like your, your limb lengths, shoulder breadth, um, body height, those basic measurements of the human body and looked at your average for your top ninja warrior woman versus, or or female versus the male ninja warrior. Um, You could actually adjust the course so that in areas where you have to reach further for something, um, you could make 
it re- proportional to the body lengths differences. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, you could actually find, probably find very, uh, a very uh, unique way to make the course um, sort of make it, make it proportional to the different bodies so that when, if you could adjust on the spot, I don't know how you would do that really, but if you could adjust on the spot, a very, a variety of things so that the course would match the female challenge versus the male challenge, then you could probably have them all on the same podium and it would be fair. Like if you, but that course would, you'd have to be very, very careful to design the nature of the challenge so that the challenge to the males is proportionally as difficult as it is for the females. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so I guess, I guess there's no way of getting around the male female difference. Either you're going to adjust the course so that the outcome is, is, is comparable or you use the same course and have, you know, you get the, the performance times and, and measurements and then have distinct podiums and, and give them the same level of awards. Like the, the problem in a lot of sports and where females feel under undervalued, of course, is something where like in, you've heard of the controversy in, in USA soccer, um, where the men's teams get way more money, um, way, way more support than the women's teams or in tennis, you know, for a long time, um, the men's, um, earnings, uh, and, and the awards that the men got were way, way higher than what the women were getting. Um, so again, it goes back to the monetary sociology stuff about how you recognize after the fact, and it's not really to do with, I mean, if you want to empower women, then make, you know, celebrate their win in the same way as you celebrate the men's win. That that's to me, that's an easy fix. Um, um, it's a lot harder to then manipulate the course to try to adjust for advantages of the different body types. Mm-hmm. No, I hear what you're saying though. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so much of this whole conversation stems back to like a year ago when, um, you know, we have the TV show, but then we have several leagues within America. And one of them, um, was a new league that instead of doing same course, different podium, um, they introduced, two different types of courses. And that was really the first time that we saw a clear different men's and women's course with some obstacles were the same. Others were a completely different obstacle for men or women. And um, that kind of like infuriated a lot of women. with And that's really where this whole conversation kind of like snowballed Mm. from. Um, But others were like, oh, no, this is good because we can finally complete the course. And others were saying, well, what you say you need, we need it easier to complete the course. So that's kind of like the initial yeah. <laughs> like last straw that kind of like got people upset. Um, but we've never, at least I haven't yet seen um, a gym or a league that's trying to set up courses that just has like a different scaled type of um, like a lache or like a type of obstacle. But it makes me think of CrossFit. Um, I just watched the Open a couple, I guess a couple weeks ago now. Um, but, you know, they're essentially the men and women are doing the same thing, but maybe the weight or the volume um, of that particular uh, event is just scaled differently. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing. Um, I don't think, again, it's probably more a matter of education or of, of, of framing it properly. No women, I don't think those CrossFit women feel infuriated that what they have to do is slightly amended from what the men have to do as far as the weight lifted or, or whatever, um, I, I just have a hard time believing that, you know, they're just amazing. Those women, the men and women, and I mean, the bodies are crazy and the same in, in the Ninja Warriors. I mean, why would somebody feel somehow like, oh, you're just purposely humiliating me by making my course easier? No, if it's adjusted to the natural male female differences, then I wouldn't see what the problem is. But if, again, if people will feel that way, if that... I guess maybe the women should be consulted. Um, Maybe they'd rather have the same course and then just have a different, you know, like have their uh, awards in the same way as men. So you'd have the male podium and the female podium, but all, all on the same course. That's fine. 
The only thing I would say about that is, has there ever been a course, and I I don't know this, um, you can a- answer my question, it, has there ever been a course where some uh, object like a ring or, or a, a somewhere that you had to reach was just simply too far for the women to reach and none of them could complete it? Well, there have been, I've seen this more on the local level than... Actually, I think even on the TV show, there have been times when they when um, they brought in a box, like so whoever's running the competition will give a box to like the shortest athletes who cannot reach a specific bar or ring. Um, so they'll be able to stand up on it just to be able to reach it. But I've heard I got a message just recently on Instagram from someone who was listening to these conversations and said, well, they had that experience where they were too short uh, to reach something and they were told like, deal with it, like you have to jump then. And she just physically couldn't reach it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's my concern is that courses would be set up then to the point where the, you know, the power puts the, po- the, the power component, if we go back to the biomotor pyramid, the power component just is not simply is not there for the 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 female athlete to be able to even get started or to complete the course. If if that would be the case, it's it's tragic because it's not her fault that she's like, you know, her her limbs are maybe two inches shorter um, than the guy's limbs because she didn't have the benefit of that growth and development. It's just about her morphology and her structure. It's not even about the performance then. And I would be more humiliated about that, just the fact that somebody set something up where I was supposed to be able to reach these things and just my body itself, just, you know, obviously sports is full of things where you just don't qualify anymore. Get away, (laughs) go away. (laughs) You don't qualify, but I mean, it's got to be within reason. And by the same token though, if you can, if you can, you know, if you set up a course that was absolutely easy or doable for the shortest, smallest female well, the man going on there, the biggest guy is just going to go, oh, this is a piece of cake, da, 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 no challenge at all, boom, right? And so mm-hmm. I can see that there would be some optimal point um, where maybe instead of something that is physically unreachable, you just make it more complex and try to figure that out, right? And I'm sure that's what happens because I don't I don't follow Ninja, Ninja Warriors as much as I should. But I, I, I think that, that there was probably when you set up a course, there's optimal points to what you do um, just to try to adapt to all the different body types that are going to be going through that course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, There's been, people have pointed out the fact that oftentimes courses are developed by men. And that's just typically because this is not, this is not a rule. There's definitely exceptions, but and for the most part, a lot of the gyms are owned by men and they tend to then be the ones who are setting up the course for their local competition and things like that. But we do have quite a few women gym owners throughout the country, um, but they might not necessarily be the ones who are setting up the course. So it's kind of like this idea of, are we having women's eyes on the course as they're being laid out, as they're being created and thought of? Um, and is there a way that we can implement that better so that they might catch certain things that a, a guy just might not be thinking about? See, that's interesting too. So you have the, the, the women being involved throughout the entire sport structure, uh, infrastructure. So the decision-making the setup, you know, I think that's a really good point. It, um, it, we can't just limit it to, you know, the women going through and the, and the tremendous athletes that are going through the course, there have to be women involved from start to finish, um, in all of the planning and all the decision making. And that's, that's where you're probably going to find your best solution. Um, Mm -hmm. I had an interesting experience as part of my journey, um, especially in the international realm. I was sitting in Africa and I had just retired from track and field. And I had just recently achieved my uh, PhD status. So I went to a local university and just it was just south of the Sahara Desert. And it was just this university in Nigeria, but it ended up being a center for Islamic studies. So because I was there, I was recruited by the International Athletics, World Athletics, to actually, um, they figured I must have some experience with, with Muslim women. Um, so they, they asked me to go to, to Iran to teach Muslim women how to coach girls. So 
you know, I went to Tehran. This was like 1995. So I was like the first w Western woman to actually, a lot of these women had ever seen since the revolution. So I went in there and, uh, you know, obviously I had to wear the veil and everything and go in there. And, and then once we got into the gym, everybody could take off their veils. It's the, the, the advantage was that I was a female coming into to women's sport. So once we got inside a gym, for example, and there were no men around, then we could just take off the hijabs. And all of a sudden it was just amazing. It's like, like her tights, gap t-shirts, everybody's ready to go. And one of the things I noticed, they invited me to a local uh, university women's track and field competition in Iran uh, uh, in another city. So I traveled down to that city, Ishfahan, and I was amazed they had what they did. And this is so it's kind of strange for us to think about when, when, because there has to be women only when they have a track meet in a university uh, town, the men, all men have to get off the campus. And so the only women left on campus were, were the sports women and, and the meet the track meet organizers. So what I found there, and it's the first time I've ever seen anything like it in my whole life um, I watched as it was females who were running the competition, female journalists, female, um, athletes, female coaches, like every, every part of that whole competition was run by women and everybody was quite happy. But I, I mean, my point was my right now, my point is, you know, we don't want that kind of a world where women are completely segregated, but on the other hand, I realized for the first time in my life that in my whole time in sport, it was always the men that were setting things up behind the scenes and reporting on it. And if, of course women compete, but we were hardly ever involved in all of the background planning. Right. And it's just, it just kind of hit me hard. Like, Oh my gosh, like these people Yes, that's what's happening. And a lot of the dis dis discrepancies I'm seeing in the West with women versus men in sports is part of that problem. It's just we don't have women ha who've had enough experience in sport doing these other jobs, being the meet director, being, you know, setting up the course, making sure the officials know what they're doing. Like, I think that as Ninja Warriors, to bring it back to the Ninja Warriors, uh, um, context. I think that as you get more women who are just a absolute beasts and champions in this, and they stay in it and become leaders in other ways, once they retire from actually competing, you know, they can start leading and they can start making these decisions and they can, they can add value to the background of how you set this up so that you do have a, a, a richer experience for the women and the men. And in ways that are probably going to be really innovative. And in, and that's such a great point that you bring up, Kara, about the background planning. I mean, it is a huge thing that nobody really thinks about. And actually, that's what's informed me to be the president of my sports association. Because I realize if, I, if, if women never step up to lead in the backgrounds, we can't complain when the courses aren't set up the way we want. Right? And I, I think, so it goes so much deeper than just... The competition day it goes throughout the whole sport structure and the governing structure and that's where you're going to find uh e equality i think mm -hmm. that is so excellent thank you for sharing that whole story and that's such an amazing point that you made but i think you're absolutely right um we do see women involved but i don't they're they're greatly involved in owning gyms and like being part of competitions for um for just like being on the sidelines, coaching, doing all these different things. But I don't know how much we're really involved in the actual planning of courses or like the planning of competition structure and things like that. So I would love to reach out even more to our own leagues and, and really understand better of like how we're structuring and how we can help people get involved. So that's awesome. So then that really leads us to how we're training our younger kids, um, you know, talking about the structure of our sport and the structure of competition um, what about our structure of coaching and classes and programming within our gyms? Um, I know there's, it seems that each gym kind of has their own philosophy, whether it's just separated by gender and age, or if it's separated purely by skill level and groups of ages. Um, and I think some, some girls I've heard from 
from the girls themselves, some have said they love being in a co-ed sport because it makes them feel um, equal. It makes them feel like they're just having fun. They're not even worrying about gender. They're just like, oh, it's it's more focused on the skill. But then mm-hmm. there have been other girls who say, you know, it, it's fun for a while. And then when they hit their teenage years, they suddenly feel like they can't do anything as well as the guys can do it. And they really feel this difference. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to dive in more of kind of like what happens at puberty, like physically. I know we know a lot of <laughs> what happens, but looking yeah. from the sport sense of it, like what what are some of the differences that start to happen to girls and boys during puberty that would affect their sports performance? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so before puberty, um, a lot of charts will show that girls and boys are more or less equal and I'm sure you've seen that too. And then, and, and you've even mentioned that some girls sometimes perform better than boys. Um, so I would say, let me go back to before longer before puberty, let's say from five or six years of age up, Mm -hmm. because what people don't capture when, if they start the charts at night at, let's say 11 years of age, or, or let's say 10 years of age, there's, there's an artifact there where, Okay, so let me let me start with six year olds and jumping. So lower body performances in track, for example, running and jumping. So at six years of age, um, they're going to be probably about ten percent difference, five to ten percent difference between boys and girls in the in the track and field world records for that age. So where boys have are still ten percent better, and then as you get closer to let's say eight, nine, ten, eleven. The girls actually actually are as good or better than the boys for a little while. And the reason that is, that happens, is because the puber- the pre-puberty and pubertal growth spurt is starting to happen in girls, but not the boys yet. So the girls have, have about a two-year head start on puberty compared to boys. So it, it'll look like they're kind of, they're very competitive in the eight, nine, 10 year old range, or 11 even. And then all of a sudden puberty kicks in in the boys and then they zoom up, right? And so then they get to much higher percentages, 10, 15, 20% better um, for the boys. So um, there are certain age ranges where you could probably put girls and boys together pretty. When do What age do they start uh, in your sport? Um, they start around like six or seven. Yeah. So there'll be quite large differences at that age between the boys and girls, but they enjoy, you know, they'll all be in there and enjoy training. And then they could probably be a lot narrower, like the difference will be a lot narrower than in eight, nine, 10, 11. And then there'll be a big difference. So the only thing, the only exception to that rule is upper body stuff, no matter what. Like if you look at the things like performances like ball throw or punching strength, boys, no matter the age, no matter the age, will almost inevitably be at least 15 to 30 percent stronger in the upper body. And I'm sure every one of us has seen that when you're starting with a group of little kids, the boys, unless the little girl has been in gymnastics, so I'm going to say that, but if you just take boys and girls from a phys ed class and you try to get them to do pull-ups chin-ups, uh, or even holding that position. Um, almost inevitably boys will outperform the girls and you can see that right away. I mean, naturally. Um, so, you know, there's that. Um, um, so I would say that, uh, coaches just need to understand that there is a difference and, um, not accentuate it, give them, you know, equivalent, tasks and, and, and tra- help them train. Um, just don't put the pressure on as far as expecting the girls to keep up all the time with the boys, uh, whether it's pushups, pull-ups, um, but in the other areas like running, you know, I mean, let them do, do their training. And, and I think girls and boys do enjoy training together. I remember in, in my day when I was coaching, when I was training for track and field, girls and boys, we always train together in the clubs. I mean, we always, it didn't matter. Like if the boy was a little bit faster then the coach, let the, let me start at like the 10, 10, 10 yards ahead. And then I say, okay, you know, Johnny, you have to chase Linda down, go, you know? And so I, my task was to not let him catch me. Right. Like, so there were things you could do to stagger things so that based on the situation, there's an equivalent challenge for boys and girls. 
so I would say that the the um it's empowering for each other, like for each of the boys and girls to watch each other um and not allow bullying, not allow jeering um to you know don't let the boys make fun of the girls um and vice versa. I think a lot of it's set up by the coach and um <clears throat> I would say that going into this the high school years then it can be it might be a little different there might be boys might require a certain kind of challenge. Um, but you just still, I still don't think you should train them any differently than the girls. I just feel like give them the same challenge, like the same drills, give them the same, um, workouts and then just notice where the differences are and, and just keep trying to improve each athlete on those differences. Right. Like I, I don't know. I just feel like, um, a lot of things that I do, even doesn't matter what age I can train those two together and we'll, I can just, as a coach, I can find a way to make the challenges equivalent um, and almost virtually the same in the same way. And you want the girls to learn the skills. You do want to challenge them. Um, so I think the biggest thing for me, the takeaway is just upper body strength is always going to be better in, in boys and males than girls. Whereas before um, puberty, it'll be mostly lower body stuff that's kind of equivalent. And then puberty adds to the lung capacity and the blood volumes and hemoglobin levels, like the endurance and cardio for the boys is goes way up as well. Um, so I think, you know, you just have to, as a coach, you just have to see what's in front of you because people have different rates of mat maturation as well. You could have two boys and I've seen this time and again, you have two boys that are, let's say, 14 years of age and one will have the body of a 12 year old and the other boy will have a body of an 18 year old. And even at the same for just the boys, just for that one age group, you're going to have a huge variety in terms of what they are able to achieve based on their, the rate of maturation and their maturity level. So it's highly complex through the teen years. That's for sure. And I don't know whether we, you know, you need to sh show respect as a coach and understanding, but, also, just give them the challenges. Let them try, you know, let them train and see what happens. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think that last sentence you just said is so important. It's how do we respect, respect one another and respect our differences, but respect them in a way that we're not looking down on one another at all, but just yeah. trying to continue to grow our strength and highlight each other's abilities. Yeah, exactly. And I would say sport, that's really the beauty of sport is if we can get to the point where we can look in awe and wonder at an athlete, whether it's a male or a female, and say, man, you rock. <laughs> I mean, that's what you just did there was just incredible. And, you know, and so what? So what if there wasn't as good as the next person over here, but you can actually see this person and, and look at what their performance is. Their performance is actually a composition, just like a musical composition, just like a, like poetry when we do sports, we're actually composing. And when you actually find a solution through a course, you're literally, it's like you're, you're composing a, a musical piece. Like it, it's actually, it's actually a creative process and it, we should celebrate all of that. Like, it's not like, you know, it's not like we're doing a disservice to acknowledge that there are differences at all. We need to celebrate those and to say, look, you know, this is a wonderful, uh, accomplishment. Uh, whether you're a boy or a girl or a man or a woman and, and accept it, you know, and just ex celebrate it. And don't, you know, just because we split up the categories, we can, we can celebrate people within those categories easily. Yeah, absolutely. I a hundred percent agree. Well, thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate all of your wisdom and your stories. It's just been so great to talk to you and thank you so much for sharing with us today. Well, thank you, Kara. It was an honor to be here, and I've learned something about the Ninja Warrior system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. To come out to some competition. After I will. I would love to. <laughs> yeah, it's it's awesome. So, thank you for having me. It's it's a real honor. Be strong. Be you. Be a ninja babe. <laughs>